worthy of respect as the men. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, we are going to get started with this session about the data retention update. Imagine a world where um, your emails, your phone conversations, uh, IP addresses, basically all metadata about your communication is being stored for six months. What do you think the implications are going to be? These three people, Ralph, Patrick, and Ricke, will tell you more about it, and they will give you detailed information what data retention means. Um, they will also give you information about state of the things, where are we right now, and also what kind of resistance has built and what they are doing. Please welcome them. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming in these big numbers at this late hour. Um, the Data Retention Directive, the European Union Data Retention Directive, has been passed by the European Parliament a bit more than a year ago. And I think in May it entered into force um, as official European Union law. So what we will try to do here is tell you a bit, for those who haven't heard about it before, what data retention is, about the directive, what's in it, what it means, and about what has happened on the national level so far. Um, we're going to have a case study presented by Reke on Denmark, because Denmark is pretty advanced in this implementation on the national level. And we're going to tell you about how people have fought and are still fighting against this thing, politically, technically, and legally. Okay, so very quickly, some questions just for meditating a bit. So one more? I'm not sure, no. <laughs> so these are all questions some people, probably from the police or something, could ask you in the future um, if this directive is implemented in your country. Current EU data protection legislation, or at least the old school good one, so to speak, says <coughs> internet service providers and um, telecom providers have to delete all data they don't need for billing. So if you have an internet flat rate, a DSL flat rate, they only need your um, account number maybe if they um, uh, get the money directly from your account, and they need your address and your phone number maybe. But they don't need to know whom you um, uh, sent an email, which websites you visited. They don't even have to know when you went online and for how long and how much traffic, you, how much bandwidth you used. There was actually an, uh, um, a court decision in Germany um, about a year ago um, where a customer from German Telecom um, sued German Telecom because he had a flat rate and they still stored his IP number a dynamic IP number he was assigned, um, and he won. So now Telecom has to delete his IP numbers immediately. And law enforcement agencies, of course, don't like this idea. They want um, as much data as they can get, um, and they, for a couple of years they've been asking for mandatory storage of communications data for several years. And the basic idea behind this is we don't even go behind specific suspects or criminals. We just want to have everybody's data stored, so just in case we might need it later. I mean, anybody could turn into a terrorist in the future, and we might want to know whom he called six months ago and from where. So the EU directive specifies which data is to be retained and the retaining party, the, the party where this data is stored, is your provider, your telephone provider or your internet provider or your email provider. So generally, they have to store data that is generated and processed in dealing with you. Your user ID, your name and address, if available, date, time, length of communication, even unsuccessful call attempts. If you call somebody and they don't answer, they still have to store it. And so this is basically for all services. For fixed line telephony, um, yeah, data of caller and called person, of course. It also includes uh, voicemail, call forwarding, conference calls, and so on. For mobile telephony, if you have a prepaid card, 
um, they have to store the date, time, and cell ID, which means basically the, the location where the prepaid card was activated for the first time. And if you have a normal contract uh, with your telephone, mobile phone provider, they have to store for each call you make your cell ID and location, your um, subscriber identification, and your equipment identification. For internet access, email, and voice over IP, they have to store your IP number you got assigned, the phone number if you do dial-up access through a modem, and um, the internet service used, mail or voice over IP. It doesn't say um, web traffic, HTTP or something like that. We, we come back to that later. So the directive, the EU directive, doesn't say anything about content retention. The providers are not uh, mandated to store the content of your text messages from your mobile phone or your email buddies or even the email subjects. They must not store URLs and you still can use prepaid mobile phone cards. Um, you can um, use uh, anonymous email providers and go to an internet cafe without having to show your government issued ID. But there's some movement in this corner, which Patrick will go into detail later. There's also no ban of anonymization services yet, like Tor or Jab. But there is, in Germany, for example, um, an attempt at the moment to make them store all the data that goes through their nodes. <laughs> so this is the directive. Member states, of course, say, okay, we transpose the directive into a national law in order to make it a, a law on the national level, but we do some add-ons, you know, we extend the scope of the data. Retention period in the directive is minimum six months, maximum two years. And then there's a national extension possible if the EU Commission, um, so a, a member state of the um, European Union, a government can um, notify the Commission and say, we have a special crisis here in country XYZ. There's um, really, really bad terrorists here and we need to get after them and whatever. And Oh, there, there also were bad terrorists here like three years ago, so we need to have data stored for three years and not two years. And they just send this letter to the Commission. If the Commission doesn't answer the letter within six months or so, it's automatically approved. Um, Poland wanted 15 years in the beginning. <laughs> Scary shit. <clears throat> so the question then is, who gets access to this data once it's stored with a provider? It's, it's not some government database. It's uh, still your provider, your telephone provider, your internet provider. Um, this is regulated in national laws. The directive only says um, government agencies can only access this data in specific cases so they don't get the full database dump. Um, but it's not really clear if this is for serious crimes only. In Germany, the draft bill um, that uh, was published a few months ago says it's for serious crimes but also for any crimes committed online. Well, Music industry, I hear you. <laughs> um, the transmission of this data to the law enforcement agencies and so on has to um, be done without undue delay, according to the directive. That could mean remote access. Uh, we have these cases with um, interception by um, intelligence agencies. And the directive says the data is only to be given to competent national authorities. <laughs> Who might that be? <laughs> So, implementation, the member states of the European Union now have time until 15 September next year to um, implement this for telephone data and for, until 15 March 2009 for internet data if they um, announced a reservation on internet data uh, in the council meeting, EU council meeting when the directive was adopted. But of course they can implement it earlier, no problem. <clears throat> yeah, in Germany, um, as I said, we have a draft now, um, a draft law, and according to this, email providers and web anonymizers have to retain 
customer data and IP number. So if, if I register a free email account somewhere with gmx.de or something, um, gmx has to ask for my name, my address, maybe even my date of birth or something like that. Um, of course, you might still be able to just fill in some bullshit, you know, but if you heard the speech before here by Caspar Bowden from Microsoft about the identity management system and so on, and maybe um, the speech of Jan Udo and myself earlier this afternoon about identity management, there are some things that, you know, in the end might join and um, GMX might maybe by law be forced to only give you an email account for free if you show a government issued identity card. Um, anyhow, and web anonymizers still can, um, in a way, work like an anonymizing proxy um, between you and a website you want to visit, but they still have, they now have to retain all the data. So it's not really anonymous in terms of uh, if the government wants access to it. Yeah, this is Germany. Um, in other countries, there have been data retention laws already before this directive was passed, so they are now working on changing them. For example, in the Netherlands, they only had a data retention law um, that applied to prepaid mobile phones, and they only had retention periods of three months. Everything else was not, was not retained. Um, Ireland has had three years of retention. Um, they now have to go down to two years. That's why they're challenging this, this in the European Court of Justice. Um, and Denmark, as I said, is pretty advanced because they've already had a law and um, they even have an implementation order now. And Rekha is going to talk about this a bit more in detail. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's really nice to be back in Berlin. This is still you, Ralph. You missed one slide, but anyhow. Okay, I'll talk a bit about the status of data retention in, uh, in Denmark. Um, and then we will we'll finish off with a bit about the European opposition uh, to data retention and, um, and what we can do next. And maybe we can, in, in the discussion, touch upon which role uh, some of you here at CCC can play in this. Actually, in Denmark, the whole issue of data retention goes back till June 2002, where we had our first anti-terror law adopted uh, with data, reti data retention as, as one element uh, for one year. It was traffic data, uh, it was not content data, but it was at that moment unclear to which extent uh, it would be only email communication or whether it would also encompass uh, web traffic uh, browsing uh, data. It's to be used for investigation and prosecution of criminal acts. That's a pretty general statement. Um, but if you then look into the another piece of legislation, which is actually our um, Administration of Justice Act, which basically regulates how you can get access to communication data, then you see that it, it's only for crimes that are wor worth uh, six years or more in prison. So compared to, for instance, the current draft in Germany, this is, this is a relatively uh, high, um, high crime, crime status. Um, the, the data, the anti-terror law was adopted more than four years ago. The executive order, as Ralph just said, was only adopted in September this year. So actually more than four years passed since we had the mandate in our anti-terror law and until we actually have data retention as a reality. And it's still not implemented. Now we have the executive order, but the ISPs actually have until next fall to get the technical equipment into place. So before they will actually start to retain the data. Um, and as said earlier, it implements the EU directive of, of February this year. If we look back at the process over the last four years, there was a very strong opposition in Denmark when, when the first uh, draft on data retention um, was presented. Um, actually, it was, it was a bit 
ironic because the anti-terror law with the data retention provision was rushed through Parliament, and there was very little opposition at that point. And it was rushed through Parliament because of the urgency of the proposal. That was the, the political argument. But after that rush, it actually took the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Technology several years to come up with the first draft on how they could then actually implement um, data retention. And why was that? Well, that was among other reasons because that there were many more technical implications that were ever foreseen when they first did the anti-terror law. And the ISPs in Denmark went out pretty strong in the press and really opposed it um, for a number of reasons that I'll come back to. So the interesting thing here, and this is why I've called it policy laundering, uh, DKEU, is that when the process starts at EU level, we have data retention stipulated in our anti-terror law, but it's not implemented, and there hasn't yet been a proposal that could gain wide acceptance um, amongst ministries and industry in Denmark. So it, it's not a reality, but the process starts at, at EU level, um, and actually the Danish Minister of Justice is very, um, very active in, in promoting it at, at EU level. And, and even, there were even quotes in the Danish press with arguments such as um, the data retention at EU level is building on the positive experiences from Denmark at a point in time where we hadn't been able to implement it for three and a half years. So that was, quite, that was quite ironic. And only after the EU directive was adopted in February this year, they were able to, to rush it through um, the, the new executive order that, that was adopted this September. Yeah, this, this is a quote um, <laughs> that is often quoted from our Minister of Justice. That was at a point uh, in 2005 where the, the Parliament were very critical towards the, the European draft. And, um, and she went out and said, um, are we most afraid of the European Parliament or of terrorism? If the Parliament cannot help, then MIPs are not an adult enough to take part in the discussion. So this was, this was an illustration of the way that the, the debate was going back and forth at, at that point in time. And it was, it was really hard to, to raise critics also, also at the national level. If we then look at the implementation of data retention in Denmark, the current executive order that we have now, it, to a large extent, it follows the EU proposal. Um, it's data that's generated or processed in the ISP's own system. There is no obligation on ISPs to invest in new system, in new technical equipment. This was one of the, the key areas of concerns that the ISPs had. They were afraid that this would be very expensive. They also had some principal arguments, but the cost argument was very strong. They didn't want to invest in new equipment. So this no obligation on ISPs to invest in new systems, I think, was part of the compromise why ISPs in Denmark have now accepted the draft or, or the order. Um, with regard to the scope, it includes the commercial ISPs, whereas the non-commercial ISPs, libraries, universities, and smaller uh, house associations uh, are excluded. It includes session logging, which is something new compared to the EU directive, which I'll come back to. And it uh, also says that there should be 24-7 uh, point of contact at the ISPs. And for that reason, there should also be some security cleaning of some of the staff at the ISPs that can assist the police in, in handing over the data. If we look at um, the type of communication devices that it includes, uh, for fixed line and mobile phones, it's pretty much the same as what Ralph just went through um, with regard to the EU directive. I've underscored um, last sales ID and physical location because that was the only difference we could, we could find on this one compared to EU. But then if we look at the, at the internet data, then we have this, um, this provision on session logging. 
I'm not. I'm still not certain that I completely understand the use of it. But it says that they must retain the first and last uh, package of every internet session of every individual user or every 500 packet. And the ISPs I've spoken to, they said that this first and last thing, they are not going to do that. So they will go for the every 500 package. Um, and for that one, it will be the IP address, the port number, and the transport protocol. And then the rest of it is pretty much the same as EU level, except location and ID of hotspots. That's in addition. With regard to email and voice over IP, uh, there's also a funny thing, namely that it's only the ISP's own email services that is included. So for instance, if I use Hotmail or Gmail, it's not included, which when we come back to, uh, to arguments from the opposition of this um, has been quite uh, a key point. The rest is pretty much the same. So <clears throat> if we just take a short look at some of the arguments that, that have uh, been raised by the, um, by the opposition, then the opposition to this, as I've said, it's been uh, digital rights. Um, a Danish NGO uh, that I'm a member of or a board member of, um, which is involved in European digital rights, um, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, We've been active, we've been vocal in this, also the, the National Human Rights Commission, the Data Protection Agency, the Association of Lawyers, um, IT Political Association, um, and some, a few other uh, organizations. But in general, it hasn't been that large amount of, of voices, also because Denmark is, is a small country. So. But if we go through the arguments, the first one I've put up here is that it it implements a surveillance infrastructure. It's basically the data retention directive at EU level and at national level basically implements a surveillance infrastructure. So whether these data are used, are ever accessed or not, the structure is there. The structure is there for future use and it will take years to pull it back, if ever. I think this is very important to remember because often we are told that um, but okay, I mean, these data, these data will only be accessed if it's really serious crimes at stake, in the Danish case at least. Um, but still, you have the surveillance structure there to an extent that you've never seen in, in the physical space. Also, um, the whole idea of data retention does not respect a very fundamental principle uh, in a, in a, in a um, society based on the rule of law, a free and open society, namely that you are only pulled out for, for investigation is if there is a concrete suspicion that you've done something wrong. I mean, there, there are there's certain borders between the state and the citizen that uh, law is set up to respect. And here, here you basically retain data just in case. It's not because that I'm under concrete suspicion for anything. All communication data is retained just in case. So this fundamental balance between the, the state, law enforcement, and the, the individual freedom, and the reasons for basically crossing that line has been moved with this draft. And this is something that has been raised, for instance, by Article 29, which is an expert group of, of uh, data protection agencies at EU level and also by Privacy International in London. From ISPs, the argument often goes that they don't want to police Internet users. They're basically, their business is to provide telecom. It's not to be policing. Then they would be in a different business. Another argument is that they don't want to bear the extra expenses. This is a waste of money. It will cost tons. In Denmark, they've estimated between 100 and 200 million Danish kroner is, is what it will cost them each year. Yeah. And, um, and because there are these many exemptions, there are all the institutions that are not included, um, and there are also all the services that are not included. So basically, you're building this expensive, invasive surveillance infrastructure 
and it's relatively easy to circumvent it if that's what you want. It's also, from an individual user point of view, relatively easy, at least if you have some technical knowledge, to, uh, to disguise your own communication. And finally, there is still very little data, very little information on the actual effect of this provision. So we are rolling out this very, this very strong measure, and you know very little about will it actually help. I mean, the whole point of it is to, uh, to uh, <laughs> prevent terrorism. That's why we're doing it. So, but we don't know very much about whether it will have that effect to any extent, because it's not really in practice anywhere. Um, I've just taken this one quote, for, one quote from uh, a Taylor manager at the at the, Nash, at the biggest uh, ISP we have in Denmark. He's been he's been very vocal in the whole debate, and he says the ambition that all communication must leave track to be retained for police investigation is simply against the basic philosophy of our society. This part I like a lot. And then comes the second part. It's also contrary to the way Taylor systems are designed. So, what do we do next? Data retention in Denmark is a reality now. Um, at first, it was hard to, to get it through at the national level, but after, after it was adopted at EU level, the battle was pretty much lost in Denmark. Uh, industry has accepted, but as, as Ralph mentioned and as, as Sir Patrick will also talk about, there's a growing opposition in other EU countries, not least Germany. Uh, there is a, a legal challenge in, in Ireland at the moment of the directive. Um, and we don't know. I mean, if I'm to have a little bit of optimism, uh, it might have an effect on, on some other countries, including Denmark. Also, at the Danish level, we will need to do a review of our um, anti-terror legislation uh, and the pro specific provision on data retention. Um, in, in the first half of, of uh, 2007. So there's also a, a slight chance to, to open some arguments, but um, also to be realistic, um, it's probably very unlikely that it will be pulled back at, at this stage. Thank you, Rike, for that overview of what's been happening in Denmark. I will now give you a short um, a rundown of um, opposition and resistance to those plans on data retention. We haven't given up all hope yet in uh, Germany, and we hope that we can do something about it, either on the political level before implementation, or if that's not possible, on the legal level after implementation. So let me first show you the legal arguments that we put forward against um, this measure. First of all, the first argument is that there's a lack of a legal basis for this directive on data retention. The European community can only legislate in certain areas and um, public safety and law enforcement is not one of those areas. We've had a ruling of the European Court of Justice earlier this year on the transfer of passenger name records to the US. You might have heard of that. And the European Court of Justice annulled the European community legislation on that, saying, I can quote that from the decision, that decision concerns not data processing necessary for supply of services, but data processing regarded as necessary for safeguarding public security and for law enforcement purposes. So the argument goes that the EU may only legislate on matters, on data that is necessary for a supply of services, and the transfer of data to the US is not necessary just as much as the retention of communications data is not necessary for the business of ISPs or telcos. So there's a good chance, and I'm pretty sure, that um, this um, directive on data retention will be annulled on the basis of a lack of a, a legal basis. 
the reason why the EU has decided to implement data retention as a directive is that this judgment of the European Court of Justice has not yet, had not read, yet been released. It has only been released in May, whereas the directive was decided on in February or March. If that had been known, I'm sure that they wouldn't have enacted it. And um, therefore, I'm sure that the directive will be annulled for this formal reason. The second legal argument we put forward against this is a human rights argument, which is sounder because it applies no matter which legal basis you use for data retention, and it's the argument of disproportionality. The um, European Court in um, Strasbourg, which legislates over the European Convention on Human Rights, has always stressed that the right to respect for private life and for private correspondence may only be interfered with in exceptional cases. You need a pressing social need for interfering with it and the measure needs to be proportionate to the legitimate aim to be pursued. The um, court said in a case from 1978, and I may, may quote it here, the court stresses that this does not mean that the contracting states enjoy an unlimited discretion to subject persons within their jurisdiction to secret surveillance. The court, being aware of the danger such a law poses of undermining or even destroying democracy on the ground of defending it, affirms that the contracting states may not, in the name of the struggle against espionage and terrorism, adopt whatever measures they deem appropriate. So the court has made it rather clear that there are limits to what we need to accept, to the interferences we need to accept in our rights. And I believe that when the interference becomes the rule and the norm, rather than the exception, that this red line would have been crossed and that the courts would hold that to be disproportionate. Because on the one hand side we have this retention of private data on our lives for everybody, for all citizens, for the entire country, for the entire communications of 365 million Europeans. And the other, on the other hand you have very little to get out of it. You might be able to solve some um, crimes, but it will probably be lesser crimes, less serious crime, and you won't be able to prevent crimes, and certainly not um, terrorism, because there are ways, technical ways of circumventing this data retention. So that's the argument of disproportionality. It also goes for the right of freedom of expression, which covers press freedom as well because if you know that your communications will be retained, then you won't feel free to express yourself, you won't feel free to give information anonymously to members of the press, for example. There's also the right of protection of property. I think that um, providers cannot be obliged to retain data without any compensation, as um, the German government wants to um, I believe in Denmark there's no rule of compensation either, is there? No. So what have we got on the procedural level? There's an action for annulment that has been brought by the Irish government um, in July of this year, I believe. Uh, the background is that Ireland actually wants to uh, retain its retention period of three years which is longer than allowed by the EU directive. But it doesn't matter from a privacy point of view because they are challenging the directive. And if the action goes through, the directive is gone for good or for bad, then the member states can decide whether they want data retention or not. It's a good thing if that directive is annulled, if only on formal grounds, for lack of a legal basis because then the member states are not obliged to implement it. The directive has, brings with it an, an obligation to be implemented in national law. An annulment would, however, mean that national implementation laws would remain valid. 
they would not cease to exist. And also, it would remain possible for the EU to enact a framework decision. A framework decision is a uh, legal instrument in the domain of public safety and um, prosecution of crime, meaning that the formal problem of a lack of a legal basis could be circumvented. Using a framework decision, you don't need the consent of the parliament, but you need an unanimous vote of all member states. And um, last year, member states have not managed to agree unanimously on a framework decision. So I believe that they would probably not be able to agree on a framework decision in the future, at least not with the content of the um, current legislation. At the same time, there are challenges, legal challenges, at the national basis. We've had a challenge in Ireland. Digital Rights Ireland is going to the Irish High Court to challenge the Irish implementation um, of data retention. And we have an upcoming German challenge with the Federal Constitutional Court, Bundesverfassungsgericht, which has a rather clear uh, jurisprudence on the matter. Um, it has said in past rulings that data retention for unspecified purposes is strictly prohibited. And it has said that the, a probable cause is a precondition for collecting traffic data. That was said in a judgment of 2003. We actually have a pending case on the legality, constitutionality of retaining subscriber data, meaning your identification data, name, address, and um, birth date, which is already law in Germany. You need to identify yourself when you sign up for telecommunication services, even when you buy prepaid cards. And there are also plans to challenge the proposed data, traffic data retention law. This class action lawsuit that we're preparing has had 2,000 participants within two months who've said we're going to challenge this law. I have uh, brought you some forms that you can fill in if you would like to participate in this action. In, on each chair opposite the entries, there should be some forms. Some of you may be sitting on them. If you could just put them out and it's for free. You can participate in this action. You can tell our lawyer that I support this action and you can, you can thank you, um, you can challenge the law in my name if it goes through. Uh, we will apply to the Federal Constitution and the Court to have the law suspended, pre preliminary, to stop it from entering into force. And then we will ask the Court to submit the case to the European Court of Justice to decide whether the Directive on Data Retention is legal. Politically, if you would like to, um, you know, to oppose this uh, proposed data retention, I suggest you could write letters to parliamentarians that um, goes in all countries, but um, in Germany we've set up a website that you can use where your protest letter is sent to all members of the ruling parties. Um, we have also had a media campaign asking media to report on data retention because many people don't know what it's about. We've had bloggers who kept reporting about the latest developments and we've taken it to the streets by um, demonstrating in Berlin and Bielefeld against data retention and surveillance more generally. I think this photo goes to show that it can be very fun to join the resistance movement. If you want to protect yourself, use anonymous, unidentified or anonymizing services for example, use prepaid mobile phone cards that are not registered in your name. Use Tor or JAP to anonymize your web traffic. Request data deletion. In Germany, you have the right to ask for billing data to be deleted monthly. And ISPs are not allowed to retain data at all, as Ralph said. Make sure that they don't. If you're a developer or a coder, I would like to see a tool for anonymous remailers that 
it's easy to use, sits in the tray, and that, you know, sends your emails via anonymous remailers. We'll need that from a few years on when retention of email data becomes reality. If you would like to help us resist this law, spread the word, write letters to parliamentarians, request media reports, ask your favorite TV stations to report on this law, and um, support the class action. We've handed out the forms. And um, maybe join our, our group Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung, which Ralf and I, among others, are members of. We have a meeting tomorrow at 3 p.m. in Saal 4 to discuss what we're going to do next year to um, discuss measures against data retention or visit our website. Yes, it's actually great to be back here again because um, at last year's Congress, exactly a year ago, we had the first physical meeting, face-to-face -face meeting of like the founding group, um, so to speak, what, of what later became the working group on data retention, Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung. And we were just like 20 people here scattered all over the Congress, meeting for one hour and exchanging emails. And now we have, I don't know, a couple of hundred people in our email list. We've had two demonstrations. We have 2,000 people who sent a letter to our lawyer to challenge this law if it becomes implemented. We have 8,000 people who um, at least registered for this class action online already. So it's pretty encouraging, in fact. And we created some unrest in the, among the social democrats in parliament, and we heard that our minister of justice, Brigitte Zypris, um, goes ballistic when somebody ever even mentions the word data retention. <laughs> so the thing is, what, this is, of course, part of a, of a more or less global development. It's not just an EU thing. and. Um, we don't believe that if we manage to stop this specific project and this specific law on the German level, for example, then everything will be fine. That's, of course, wrong. In the US, the debate about data retention has just started this year. Um, funnily, um, when US politicians talk about data retention, they never mention terrorism. They only talk about it in <laughs> relation to um, child pornography. So you can see. They want the same, and the arguments for why they want it is basically exchangeable. Um, we might see, or will probably see, if this gets enacted and, and we really cross this watershed, we will see some mission creep. We will see web traffic data retention for sure. Uh, we will see if storage uh, becomes cheaper and cheaper um, content data retention. And of course, this creates functional needs. So it might, in the end, completely make illegal anonymous internet access. So this sounds like China or other countries at the moment, but it could be reality in the EU in the next few years, if people don't stop it. And um, we see a development towards retention of other data. In the UK, um, in uh, the greater London area, um, the uh, surveillance cameras have already started to scan um, license plates from cars and store these license plates and um, just in case you need to know who, uh, which car crossed which uh, street at, uh, I don't know, four weeks ago or something. Um, they also, just recently I read, they, they have a um, system in place in the London Underground in the public transport um, for people who have a like, subscriber card. Uh, which is machine-readable, RFID chip. Um, they read not only when you enter the system, if you have a valid card, of course that's, that's okay to read that fact, but they also read when you exchange trains, when you leave the system, and so on, and store this data for a few weeks. Pretty scary. And um, where the, the whole debate on, on um, retaining DNS data and other genetic data um, for, first they start with criminals, and they take suspects, and then they take I don't know, newborn babies. Um, and of course, um, they are taking fingerprints of everybody now. If you want to apply for a new passport next year, you get fingerprinted, and the fingerprints are stored somewhere. So this whole development is really a paradigm shift, and that's why we are fighting so hard against it. Um, it's the end of the presumption of innocence. It turns everybody into a suspect. And the basic question here is actually, whom do you trust? This is really the title of the, um, of the Congress here. Um, 
should you trust your government to, to handle this data in a nice way, or is it about the government distrusting people? Okay, I think with this we are through, and we are open for any questions. And we hope you join our fight. Uh, as you know, Brussels is currently working on an intellectual property enforcement directive for a criminal enforcement of intellectual property, and most people believe that it's really targeted against P2P file shares. Do you see any connection, any, any, do you see any connection between uh, P2P file sharing and this particular thing? Because you know, record companies, they are losing business and uh, stores are closing because they're losing all their business. I think they're... They haven't, they haven't any business anymore they, uh, they, because they are obsolete because of the internet age er, era. But they, they're fighting back and they're trying to do that in the US and they're doing, trying to do it now in, in, in Europe. Can you comment on that? It's true that in debates we have observed that the ISP were opposed to data retention, whereas the content providers were in favor of it. So they're very much proponents of that law and there is a danger that this data will be used to prosecute, to prosecute file sharers. In Germany it will become reality because as Ralf said, um, this data can be accessed for any crime committed online, including of, including of course infringements of intellectual property law. So um, you'll be able to prosecute file sharers using the data that your ISP stores. This person has used this dynamic IP address. Um, I have uh, three comments, um, maybe one of those is a question. Um, the first one is um, I want to know what uh, Ireland as a state or the government wants uh, to, to, what kind of arguments they want to put forward in the ECJ trial. Is it about the, 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 fir the first pillar and third pillar um, argument? I think uh, um, either they, they, they think this uh, directive on the co-decision uh, with the Council and the Parliament was illegal and they, they wanted a, uh, some kind of a veto right in the Council where they need unanimity. I think that's what they want. And um, if there will be uh, some other country, I don't know if there is a deadline, but if there will be another country uh, that will ask the CJ to challenge the directive under the other, um, other community law that the ECJ uh, can interpret? Um, that's my uh, first question. And the second question is, uh, do you see a link between the fact that now most politicians in Brussels are um, pushing uh, the constitutional treaty only to remove this unanimity in the Council? And how do you see uh, if this unanimity in the Council is removed in the new, new future and if those laws uh, will be passed on the co-decision with the Parliament, how do you see it, it can, um, it can uh, change the things in, in making uh, new criminal laws in Europe? Well, first question, Ireland argues merely for the lack of a legal basis. So Ireland doesn't say this directive is disproportionate. It couldn't because it has, de it has had data retention even before the directive came through. So it only says this directive lacks legal basis. It's a first pillar directive, but it does not cover services. It covers law enforcement. Second question, there is a relation in my opinion um, regarding the re requirement of anonymity. Because um, the European Parliament, by adopting, by agreeing with the Council on this directive, has very much um, made a power brokerage. It has tried to buy itself into this um, domain of law enforcement and public security by saying, OK, we will accept this data retention, although our own committee of human rights has rejected it. But we, we will accept it, this compromise because in the future we want to have a say in the field of the third pillar, in the field of uh, law enforcement and public security. So certainly I, see, I can see a relationship there. Um, 
if I may add, um, but on the other hand, the fact that the European Parliament in the end accepted this directive after really resisting it for quite some years, um, that was due to the German elections last year. Because once we had the grand coalition in Germany with the Conservatives and the Social Democrats, they also, um, the, the um, chief uh, chairman of, the, uh, of their factions in the Brussels Parliament are also both from Germany. So after the German coalition went through, um, those guys in Brussels suddenly agreed and said, okay, we, we want to have data retention now. Small question for Ricke. Were there ever in Denmark any experiences? Were there um, queries for retention data? Are there any positive or negative experiences? Was ever data requested that was retention? It actually is not implemented yet. That, that's the ironic thing, that it has been stipulated in law since June 2002. And now the executive order that has been the, the, the long-awaited order to, to basically implement it has been adopted in September, but now the ISPs has until fall next year to basically bring the technical uh, equipment into place. So there is no experience still. It's been a process now for four years. And that, that's the ironic thing, that when Denmark was promoting it so much at EU level, there were no experiences in Denmark. And then afterwards, when it was adopted at EU level, that was used as an argument in the national debate. Um, I can maybe fit in the slide I forgot earlier. Um, the directive also has a provision saying, um, after three years, um, we will have a review of the directive and see if we really need it in the future, if we need to change it and so on. So this is the part where they really try to work with, with data on successes and so on and really see if, if this instrument is needed at all. The problem is um, the review, according to the text of the directive, is done based on access statistics, which means every time the law enforcement agencies ask for data, this is um, counted in the review, but it's not based on charges or even convictions. So it's just uh, done on, on the basis of demand by law enforcement agencies, but not on, on the basis of when it was really needed to convict people. Um, and there's no sunset clause for the directive also. So we might never get rid of it if the court doesn't abandon it. I can contribute something to that question as well, I hope. There has been a study by the German Federal Criminal Agency that says that in 280 cases, um, the traffic data has not been available that would have been needed to um, prosecute crimes. Um, sounds a lot, but um, it's, it's actually a very small fraction of all crimes that cannot be solved. Uh, every year there are 2.8 million crimes in Germany that cannot be solved, mostly for lack of traces. And of these, it's only 0.06% or something that um, could not be solved because of a lack of traffic data. So um, we don't think it's a case for, um, that, it's ne that it's necessary to retain all of that data. I have two questions. Uh, first, what exactly is the definition of an ISP in the uh, legislation? Is it anyone who provides IP access to the end user? Uh, does it include server hosting facilities? Second question is, uh, you said that non-commercial ISPs are exempt from that rule. That was new to me. I knew that in the Telekommunikationsüberwachungsverordnung, uh, any ISP who has less than a thousand customers is exempt. And I just want to get the confirmation on this that any ISP who does works non commercially is really exempt from the European data retention rules. That was how I understood it. I think uh, it was the. I was referring to the non commercial ISPs with regard to the Danish implementation because in Denmark there is exemption for non commercial ISPs and also for smaller housing associations. 
And what exactly is an ISP? That was the first one. And do you maybe know um, what the German law says about non-commercial ISPs? <laughs> Um, it's actually pretty identical um, European directive and the German law in that domain. ISP is any provider of um, access to the internet, um, meaning it covers the traditional ISPs like um, T Online or whatever, but also uh, hotspots and um, um, wireless LAN providers. And there is no exception actually in European legislation for non commercial services. It says any service that is publicly provided. So if you have a, a wireless LAN um, that you privately offer for free, uh, but open to anyone, then you would be obliged to retain the um, IP addresses you assign to users. You're not actually obliged to identify them according to the European law or according to the draft German law. You're not obliged to identify the users, but you're obliged to retain the traffic data, um, the IP address, that is. I have uh, just something to add um, about the telecom court decision. When I read about it, I wrote to my ISP and uh, set them a time limit to delete all my IP data um, and don't save them anymore. And um, I wanted it to, uh, I wanted the Datenschutzbeauftragten to write it back to me and um, he did, and he said, um, thank you for your request. We, also, uh, we already do so. We don't save any IP of you. And um, so that's just something I wanted to add. By the way, um, the ISP is versatile, versatile. It would be nice. I'm, I'm not sure if there is a list or something like that. It would be nice to, to have a list of which IPs are storing your data and which IPs are not. ISPs. Okay, there's a list on Patrick's blog. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> www.daten-speicherung.de we, we have time for about three more questions and then we need to finish off. Uh, again, another question. Um, I was interested by the by your mentioning you mentioned the fact that you can use national uh, courts to uh, so that they can refer to the ECJ to to somehow um, annul the directive. Um, my question is, uh, what kind of arguments you will use under uh, the national courts so that it it will refer to the ECJ to eventually annul the directive? Um, I want to hear about those. Two arguments, as the slides have said. First, lack of a legal basis. And secondly, um, incompatibility with human rights for reasons of disproportionality. There's actually at the moment a discussion in Germany on whether this directive needs to be transposed at all. Some argue, namely me, that it is actually inexistent the European Court of Justice said that if a legal instrument is gravely, um, um, you know, erroneous, if it has grave errors and those are actually obvious, that it is inexistent and it doesn't need to be transposed even before the European Court of Justice has decided on it. And I believe that after this decision regarding the PNR data, data that it is obvious that um, data retention will be cancelled on the same grounds. So I had a, a technical legal question um, and a question about data mining. And the technical legal question is supposing the Digital Rights Ireland uh, suit is ultimately successful at Strasbourg, at ECHR. Um, the, of course, all EU member states are signatories to ECHR, but so are many other countries. But the European Commission, at least before there is a European constitution, um, does not, is not a signatory state of ECHR. So if a, a case was to succeed against one country under ECHR, would that decision be binding uh, against other EU member states, or would it have no necessary connection with other EU member states? 
And the second question about data mining is one of the things I've, I've always worried about, particularly with the British uh, proto-data retention law of 2001, is the terms of that law do not say that the access to data has to be uh, on an individual case-by-case -case basis. It's perfectly possible for the, uh, the request to say, in a data mining sense, um, well, we don't know who we're looking for, but find us somebody who was accessing this website or this IP address on a certain date and then accessing this IP address on a week later and then maybe who was talking to this other internet user with this email address. So the request can actually be formulated very abstractly as a, almost a data, an open-ended data mining query against a particular ISP's entire body of data. Um, do you know if this varies uh, across uh, any transpositions that have so far occurred or if the directive itself would hinder or allow that sort of data mining query? Okay, I'll take the first question. Um, a decision of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg would be binding only between the parties, so uh, between Ireland and um, the person um, suing them, digital rights, but the European Convention itself is binding for all member states. Um, you're right in that it's not binding for the EU itself, but the European Court of Justice in Lux Luxembourg, which is competent for the European Community and Union, recognizes the human rights as recognized in the um, European Convention um, as case law, as common law in all member states, and it um, basically implements those this European Convention of Human Rights as well as the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights into its own jurisprudence. So basically it, it would um, almost certainly um, say that um, this directive is disproportionate if the European Court of uh, Human Rights had said so. Yeah, on the data mining question, um, I think there are several like layers or, or possibilities um, of data mining. First of all, is, of course, uh, like um, reverse lookup, if you want to know um, from the retained data which IP number was assigned to Caspar Bowden on a specific day, you of course want to do it the other way around. Who had this IP number when? And then, oh, it was Caspar. Um, the other thing is to do, um, I wouldn't call, exactly call it data mining, I would call it a dragnet investigation or something. I, I'm not exactly sure about the English term. The German term is Rasterfahndung, where you have some specific criteria saying, I don't know, has called this and that number more than 20 times in this time, has uh, done this from prepaid mobile phones in the area of Greater Berlin or something. Um, and then give me all people who match these criteria. Um, there was a German uh, constitutional court decision earlier this year that said, um, because they, they did it in Germany right after 9-11 in 2001, um, and they said, it, could be possible to do this for the government, for law enforcement agencies, but only because it's such a severe um, uh, breach of, of privacy and so on. They can only do it under clear and present danger. And this is, of course, like if you have an immediately um, um, up upcoming terrorist attack or something like that. It's, of course, not really uh, proportionate to do this for, uh, like, uh, um, catching uh, teenagers who share music online, you know. Um, data mining would be one more step, you know, just taking the whole database and see if you can get find patterns where you don't have any criteria in the first place. I think that they, they wouldn't even try to do that anyway. But of course, I mean, the, the thing is, this is a legal um, situation as far as I understand it. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but of course, once these data this data is retained and is sitting there for six months or up to two years in some countries, of course it creates new interests and curiosity and people will want to, have to use it, of course. And I'm, I'm sure there will be a security politician um, who will say, we have, to, we have an obligation to access this data and mine it and do whatever we want in order to save our children and, you know, it's out there, why shouldn't we use it? So data minimization, don't store it in the first place. 
What kind of um, quality or is there any link between the data retention and the um, cybercrime convention we had a few years ago, that, that discussion here? Um, is there any link? Because maybe it's only a part what we're seeing here and we're heading the next years. Maybe it's a, a quite bigger issue what we're heading for. Well, I think with regard to the Cybercrime Convention, it's a bit ironic that um, that NGOs thought that it was so horrible at the time. Um, and now, looking at it from the data retention perspective, it, it looks almost okay when you read through the paragraphs. Um, as far as I recall, the, the Cybercrime Convention has uh, content data for a shorter period, for a three-month period. Um, and we've actually, that's, that part has been implemented in, uh, in Denmark for a couple of years now, but it hasn't been used very much. The Cybercrime Convention basically is about mutual cooperation between states that are signatories to it, meaning that one state can ask the other, uh, we need um, you to intercept data on one of your citizens because we need it in the course of a specific criminal investigation. And um, it, only, it, it uses, doesn't um, require data retention, but it uses data preservation, meaning that one member state can ask another to have data preserved that is already existent, or one member state can ask another to have data recorded for the future that is not yet existent. But it doesn't say anything on um, data retention. So how this is important in relation to data retention is only in regard to the access to data that is already existent. If you retain data for six months or one year or two years, then all other states signatory to the Cybercrime Convention can request that data if they need it in the course of a specific investigation. And there are states among that, like the US, like Azerbaijan, and, um, you know, Eastern European states uh, or um, Russia um, where you can't be sure at all what will happen with that data that um, you have forwarded. I mean, you forwarded it for a certain specific case, but the Department of Homeland Security may well retain the data for another 40 years. I'm just showing you here the date of our meeting tomorrow, 3 p.m., Saal 4, if you would like to discuss um, campaigns that are planned for next year against data retention of the German Working Group on Data Retention, but it will be held in German and it will be a working discussion, but it's public for everyone to join. Thank you.